Thanks for inviting me uh, here tonight. Um, too bad I can't be there in person. You can see how green my office is. Uh, this is where I do all my design work uh, and green is very soothing. Um, but uh, so tonight I'll talk to you uh, about box making, but it's really gonna be about, I guess, how I think about boxes and what I'm trying to accomplish when I make a box. Uh, and it'll also just maybe have some general advice about design in there. And uh, I don't know quite how this will work, but I guess if you have a question, uh, I guess if you just start talking, I'll hear it, I don't know, but, or we can save questions till the end. Um, yeah, just be sure to unmute yourself and shout. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, excuse me. So uh, I'll just get started. I have a, uh, a like a, you know, a keynote to share, a PowerPoint basically. Um, so let me, where did that go? I'm upstairs. Okay, now shouldn't that, that is, it's not showing up for y'all now, right? Yeah, it's on. Did y'all see keynote when I pulled up keynote? No. Okay. Uh, so I know how to share, oh, share content. There we go. Only the host can share in this meeting. I need to be allowed to share. While we're working that out, what do you guys think of putting questions in the chat? As long this as I'm able to- an easy way to do it. Tim, I think that's the smartest idea. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. All right. Can y'all see that now? No. Nope. No, you okay. turned your video off. Well, yeah, that's because I went away from Zoom. Um, so I've never done this on Uh, well, I'm using my iPad right now. Screen broadcast, start broadcast. Okay. Now we're going. Okay. There we go. Got it. Yep. Got it. Okay. So um, instead of like diving in, most of the boxes that I make are not very complicated to make. I use a lot of miters and the techniques are fairly simple. And I don't know if that's because I'm not a very good woodworker uh, or because I just like to make things that are uncomplicated. I like, you know, I guess I like to uh, see what I can do uh, with simplicity before I jump into complexity. Uh, so what I'll talk a lot about tonight is what I think about when I'm setting out to make a box and how woodworking or furniture making fits overall sort of into my, uh, my, my approach to, to living. And um, if you don't, some of you may know this, some, most of you probably don't. In a previous life, before I worked to find woodworking, I was a philosophy professor. So sometimes I tend to the philosophic side of furniture making and woodworking. But um, anyway, so what I wanna talk about is uh, what goes on around the actual technique that gets done. All that thinking, all the why that happens. So let's start. The one thing that I encourage people to think about when uh, they ask me about designing and about making boxes is that you have to be able to look beyond utility. This uh, is something that I probably have always believed in even before I got into woodworking but didn't know it, but it was really driven home to me 
by my first boss at Fine Woodworking, who anytime I made a new box would make a joke about, oh, that's where you put your pot, um, which, you know, I don't, was not true. <laughs> so, uh, but also, it also made me eventually I realized that he only could understand furniture in terms of its function. And in function, he strictly meant by utility. What is it used for? And I think that uh, furniture, like most things that we as human beings create, um, its, its function or its use is not the same as its purpose because purpose involves the meaning of something in our lives, at least when it comes to things like furniture. Um, and so the, the meaning that a piece of furniture has in your home and in your life is larger than the, the utility that it has. And so I always encourage people to think about that when they're setting out to make a piece of furniture, whether that's a box or a wall cabinet or a table, to give some thought to the place that it'll have in your home after it's completed. Because a, a, as furniture makers, I know that we get very heavily focused on what takes place in the shop. But really a piece of furniture, it, its story doesn't really begin until it leaves your shop and ends up in somebody's home and in your home or whoever's home and it starts to get used. And as it is used, hopefully on a daily basis, it begins to take on meaning in the lives of the people who own it. And so its story expands. And we know, I mean, this is, if you think about this, it's sort of obvious if you think about the sentimental value that pieces of furniture take on. And that's why they're passed on from one generation to the next. And it's why as a, you know, as a dad, I look back and think, oh, that's where my daughter dented the table or something like that. And it just, uh, it gives the, the piece more meaning. And so when I'm designing and making boxes, I try to keep my focus on that so that as I am doing the technical side of woodworking, it's informed by a larger understanding of the purpose of what I'm making and not just its utility. So one of the things that I'm going to show you tonight is a lot of what I'm, well, a lot of what I'm going to show you are different tea boxes and tea cabinets that I've made. And they all have the same utility to hold little tea packets. Um, but they all are very different. And I'll talk some about their design and what I was thinking about when I designed them. And I can also talk about construction. So if you have any questions about the technical side of the construction, I'm more than happy to answer it. This first little box that you see here um, is Riffs on Cherry sides. And the lid is made from plywood that has shops on veneers on the top and bottom. And then the edges are milk painted. And I made it out of plywood so that I could fit it really tightly and to get sort of an airtight seal there to keep the tea fresh. Um, so uh, this is, you know, there's definitely, so this is something I made for a specific I, uh, I was able to uh, show up as a viewer, but I'm not getting sound. Who's not getting sound? Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. You're doing. You're doing fine. We have a new yes. user here who can't seem to uh, work okay. out the details. All right. Just keep going. Yeah, I thought it might be a ghost in the machine. Um. So. This first box that I'm showing you, you can see there, you know, it is in fact made uh, for a specific use uh, to hold tea packets. Um, but there's more to it than that. Uh, you have to give it some sort of personality or life 
And I tried to accomplish that by uh, making this sort of little, almost like a timber frame sled foot base that it sits on. And that the, the, the design of the pull mirrors the design of the base and uh, it's wrapped in thread to give it a little bit of texture there. So um, when I was designing this, I thought about more than just, you know, what is it going to hold? I thought about how will this look on the counter? How does it in a sense relate to drinking tea? You know, for me, I don't actually drink tea or coffee for that matter, but uh, I do have, you know, I've read some about like the Japanese tradition of the tea ceremony at fine woodworking every afternoon we had what we called tea time and so there was a sort of ritual to that as well and the structure that the of the feet and of the pole i got the inspiration for that from looking at japanese temples and knowing that they you know sort of the timber framing that goes into making those and it sort of comes from there um so this is just a place to start out and talk about, you know, the, the, the relationship between utility and purpose and meaning and how you uh, need to look beyond just utility. So this box was one of the 52 boxes that I made that ended up in the book. So when I uh, am designing things and uh, I, I lean towards simplicity. I'm a big fan of shaker furniture. So a lot of what I do is informed by the things that the shakers embodied in their furniture, but I don't make reproduction shaker furniture, but the shaker, the sort of the, the design principles that they, uh, uh, and that, that they took advantage of when making furniture, are similar or you know, more or less the same that I like to take advantage of or to emphasize in my work. And the way that I have boiled it down or distilled it for myself is that I use as few design elements as possible in my work. So you won't see moldings and you won't see carvings and uh, or in, no inlay. All of that type of ornamentation is absent. And that means that there's really not much left to focus on when you are designing. And the, so you have to really dial in the things that are left to you. And the big one that's left, and this is what the shakers really did well, is proportions. So um, I work very diff, you know, diligently when I'm designing a box or a wall cabinet or a piece of furniture on just getting the proportions of the parts right. And I normally start with whatever face that you will see the most. So like a wall cabinet, you see the front of it. So I work on the front of the wall cabinet, designing it and trying to get those proportions just right. And for the box, it depends on whether you know, it's going to sit on a table or on a, on a dresser, you know, what I'm going to sort of work on and focus on to, to try to get the proportions as, as good as possible. The proportions are like, you know, beautiful bones. And if you get them right, they really can carry a piece of furniture on their own. Uh, but if you get them wrong, there's almost nothing you can do to save it. Uh, so I look at proportion, I'm also really fascinated with patterns. Uh, I see when I look out at the world around me, that's something that I notice a lot is patterns in bricks or patterns in window panes, uh, patterns in shadows and light, things like that. Um, and I'm also uh, very interested in uh, color. So, you know, one of the things that I love about the, you know, the natural world and being out in the woods is the great variety of color that you see. Just 
just in springtime, if you go out into the woods and the, and the sun is shining through all the different new fresh leaves, there's so many different hues of green and the light is becomes like this amazing dancing kaleidoscope of, of greens. And, you know, it's similar in the fall when all the leaves are changing, but uh, you can find, you know, the beautiful interplay of color and, and pattern and light and dark in the world. And those are things that I uh, personally have always found fascinating and beautiful. And so they show up in the work that I do now. So uh, to talk a, a little bit about simplicity, uh, this is a, a tea cabinet that I made. And uh, this was box 51. And I consider it a box. You've got two boxes stacked on top of each other. Um, this box uh, really illustrates what I, uh, the things that I focus on in my work. Um, so there is, you know, a total, more or less a total lack of ornamentation, uh, except for, of course, the Kumiko and the base, I guess. But um, there's, you know, very little, you know, almost no ornamentation, but even that ornamentation is, it's clean lines, it's creating a pattern, it's creating a geometry. And it's also integral to the use of color in this box, you know, the pale color of the basswood set against the green fabric and surrounded by the, you know, the beautiful earthy reddish brown of cherry. So um, this piece is, uh, you know, not, there's nothing ornate about it. And there's nothing complicated about it. Uh, it's just a very simple three layers uh, stacked one on top of the other. Um, in terms of technique, the, this, these pieces are, I think, around nine inches deep, if I remember correctly. So the two boxes are mitered together. Uh, and uh, these are not splined. I would probably do a hidden spline on these joints now, but the original I did not. And I know for a fact that it's still together. Uh, the, the miter joint is actually a lot stronger than people give it credit for, um, at least if it's done properly and glued up properly. Um, but so it's just a miter joint at the corners and um, the base I will admit was, is it maybe a little complicated to make? Um, it's the, the, the plinth there has posts at all four corners that uh, there's a frame at the top and a frame at the bottom that are sort of like mitered frames that get notched after they're put together. And then those posts or legs or whatever you want to call them are glued in and trimmed flush uh, to, to the frames. So um, this piece, uh, does, it's not, you know, there's no super complex technique involved here, uh, which is something that I also really like. I like that you can take very basic and fundamental woodworking techniques and skills and still make something that's really beautiful. I always, uh, when I'm teaching, I always want the students to focus less on the techniques and more on the end product, what, they, what it is that they're creating. You know, furniture making is a lot like being the conductor of an orchestra in which you're playing all of the instruments. So you do have to be able to cut dovetails well and cut miters well, but more importantly, you have to be able to take all of those individual uh, sounds or movements and bring them together into a har harmonious whole. And uh, I, one of the things I really like about making clean, simple furniture is that in some ways there's like there's nowhere to hide. You can't, uh, you know, uh, hide the fact that you don't really know how to play the clarinet, so to speak. 
You know, you either know how to do these few basic cuts and techniques that you're using, or you don't. And, um, and that is, you know, that I like that challenge of having to execute to perfection so that the simplicity of what I'm making is not uh, messed up. All right, I hope that makes sense. Um, Tim wants so again, this, you adhere to the concept of joinery as design. Uh, yeah, I guess so, you know, um, yeah, actually I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later about using the structure of a piece of furniture to create as, as a design element. Uh, and that does involve using the joiner. Yeah, I think that's what you mean, right? I think so, Tim. Sorry for the delay. Yeah, it basically, I guess, was thinking about in the piece that you have there, how those corners come together. Are they mitered? Are they dovetailed? And in a piece like this where no one's going to climb on it, it's not going to be pulled at hundreds of times. It doesn't need dovetails. You know, is it just a butt joint with a veneer on the front? I can't really tell, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on that as boxes can be rather ornately joined and these are just mitered together um right there's not a lot of uh stress on these joints and so they don't need to have like the strength of a dovetail joint but also aesthetically here a dovetail a dovetail would not be a good choice because that alternating in grain long grain in grain long grain of the dovetail becomes something that's visually disruptive Whereas what you when you can when you look at this box, uh, the grain runs. If you look at the photograph of the open drawer that has the tens in it, the grain runs up over both pieces and across the top. And um, so, if there were dovetails there, you would interrupt that grain flow. Whereas a miter sort of allows that grain flow to uh, subtly say something, um, but also allows the grain and the joinery to emphasize the shape of these pieces and to uh, allow, allow the proportions and the lines to step forward. Whereas dovetails are, they're, I mean, I don't mean this in a bad way because I love dovetails, but they're kind of a loud joint. When, when they're exposed, they say a lot visually. So uh, here I went with the miter joint and I usually go for miter joints and boxes for that reason that I don't want that joinery to disrupt the lines and proportions of the box. Um, so here, uh, this is this box just also illustrates a different way to approach the utility of holding tea packets or loose tea. You know, instead of having them in what it would a lot of us would think of when you think of a tea box, that first thing I showed, something like that. I took that idea of needing to hold these things and said, well, let's separate them into separate drawers. And once I do that, what kind of case? or box am I working with and what can I do? So still thinking about the use of the piece, but not accepting how that use has been accommodated in the past, which is usually a little box that sits on the counter and has a couple of individual cubbies for tea packets, you know? So just rethinking how to fulfill that utility allows me to change the form of the piece, but also then ultimately the meaning of the piece in someone's house. Because this piece uh, has a very different presence in the home than a little tea box that sits on the counter. This, you know, would probably be. Uh, in a dining room or somewhere where you actually went and sat and had tea and this is on this this is on the sideboard or something like that all right so it 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 uh it creates 
a different conversation in the home and so creates a different type of meaning or a different story for itself. Uh, so this was uh, when I just a few minutes ago mentioned that uh, something else that I do, and you can see in, in the piece, we did, in the little tea cabinet we just looked at, you can see it there as well. And I think the Shakers did this extremely well, that they use the structural elements of a piece of furniture to create something that was aesthetically pleasing. A lot of times they would use the drawers and the doors of a piece to create patterns on the front of, say, a sewing uh, counter or a sewing desk, something like that. And you, when you strip down to just the lines, the proportions, all of a sudden the structure of a piece, the individual components of it uh, have, a, have a, a stronger voice, have a stronger visual presence. And so you can use them uh, to create something that's aesthetically appealing or, or you know, aesthetically interesting to look at. Um, and this uh, piece that's here, which is a kindling box that I made, um, one, here I did use dovetails and then through tenons. And the way that, you know, the, the dovetails between the base and the bottom of the box itself line up then also the through dove, the through more uh, tenons up higher are laid out in a way that mirrors the layout of the dovetails at the bottom. So they be, you know those three joints which are visible from the side become not just uh, a structural element but also an, you know an aesthetic element of the piece. Uh, but more importantly on this one, you know, separating the feet from the box itself and then adding this little drawer inside creates a, uh, uh, a, 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 a story that's much different than if this were what we often see with kindling boxes, which would just be the top of this turned 90 degrees so that it opened up. And in fact, I made this the way I made it because when I was at the magazine, two of my colleagues made kindling boxes and they were both beautiful, but they were both turned with the opening facing up, which is what you always see. And I have to admit, I'm a bit of a natural born contrarian. So I was just like, well, I can't make one like that because they made them like that. So what can I do that would be different? So I turned it and once I turned it, you know, a whole bunch of ideas or possibilities opened up to me in terms of what I could have it look like and what I could, uh, what per meaning I could give to this that would be different from a, another type of kindling box, you know, and it goes beyond just, in some sense, the structure which organizes the kindling when it's in the box also is something that becomes part of the, the aesthetic of the piece overall. Uh, and, and the use of negative space as well. But um, so anyways, clear lines allow you to emphasize construction. And it also allows you to rethink how parts relate to one another. And so that you can start using the individual components or parts of a piece to say things that you might not say otherwise. Um, and me personally, I always try to design so that my work makes a strong graphical statement. Um, I hope it's not too weird that I'm talking about, you know, pieces of furniture creating their story and speaking. And of course that's a metaphor, but there is a way, you know, they very much do make visual statements. And they also uh, have, so they, they, they have an influence on your life, right? Think about that chest of drawers where all the drawers were always binding when you opened it. You know, think about how that impacted your daily routine. And um, so they, they do say something to us. All right, so uh, strong graphical statement. Matt? 
Yes. Let me ask a question before you move on from your kindling box. So the dovetails, um, since they're exposed, they, um, you know, by default, are going to be part of the design of the box. Yes. So I was wondering if, um, if uh, how, how did you decide to make it so that the pins were on the side of the box? Uh, because I, I would guess that most people who would make dovetails would set it up, set this thing up so that the tails would be the thing that you could easily see because that's always the more impressive thing than like, you know, a bunch of rectangles of end grain. I'm pretty sure this is Wilbur. Yeah. And I'm, I'll not take that as you saying that these are not impressive dovetail joints. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think if I remember correctly, my decision to do this was explicitly because I was going to use through tenons up top. Mm -hmm. And so there was going to be exposed in grain. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that to be mirrored in the joint down at the bottom, the two joints at the bottom. If you can, if you can envision in your head what, if you were to see tails instead of uh, the, the ingrain of the, if you were to see the face grain tail mm -hmm. instead of the ingrain of the tails, think how different this would look. Right, right. You know, there would almost be some, it would be, it would not be as harmonious. It would not, there, it would not be as subtle and quiet. It, it might still work, but I, I don't, it would not work as, as well as this does, I, I believe, personally. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely uh, an aesthetic choice, but also, so dovetails definitely have a mechanical advantage to them, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're making a wall cabinet, then you absolutely want to put the tails on the sides so that if there's any weight, in a sense, pulling the, the, the case down, it's only going to tighten up the joints at the top and mm -hmm. also the joint at the bottom. So there's, a, there's a, a good structural reason to do that on a piece that, say, hangs on the wall. But on a piece like this, where uh, it does not have that same type of force pulling down on it, um, you're free to put the tail on either piece. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there would be any chance of like the sides being pushed out, not really in this box, but if, if you were making something in which the sides were somehow gonna take a lot of force, like racking force or something, then you would wanna put the tails on the top and bottom as well. You know, that's why we put the tails on the sides of the drawers, as I know you understand, because when you pull on the drawer front, it tightens that dovetail up, mm -hmm. you know, and if it were loose. I mean, I know that no, no one makes loose dovetails, but, um, you know, if, if that were the case. so. Here, the structural or, or the, the mechanical strength of the dovetail isn't needed. So that allowed me to take advantage of the aesthetics of the dovetail and to use it in a way that mirrored the through tenons up top. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. yep. Ask a question? Yeah. So um, the, can I ask a question? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that um, that riser that this thing is sitting on, I assume that there's a piece of wood in the back of that, uh, keeping the whole thing from racking. No, there is no. not. So those dovetails no. are just basically the entire yeah. structure of it? Yeah, I mean, this is a small piece. Nobody sits on it. Um, and it's not, well, it's not terribly small, but, you know, it's... Uh, it can be used as a, as a low end table next to a couch, for example. Uh, you know, it would be below the arm of the couch. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't get any racking. It's not, a, you know, it's not, you know, a chair gets racking because people are standing and sitting in it. And, but this piece, no, that, nothing like that ever gets applied to it. So there is, in theory, there could be racking forces. In actuality, there never are any racking forces on it. Uh, obviously, the owners aren't doing enough drinking. <laughs> no, it's. I still own this piece, and I do plenty. It's yours, that. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you're I not doing enough drinking. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't own a wood stove, so right now I do use it as, you know, next to the couch. 
Um, yeah. So you do put stuff on top of it. I mean, that seems like part of the function of this design is that you get to use this yes, service. Yes, yeah. so. but again, that's not going to introduce racking forces. But there's also the, the back of the whole piece, the back of the kindling part of the box mm -hmm. is a frame and panel back. And that is, um, I'm trying to remember how I attached it now. I think I both glued it and nailed it in place with like cut nails. Um, so that is also, that's a huge, if you think about it, that's like 10 or 12 inches of shoulder in between the two sides of the kindling box. It's not gonna rack. If you, if you understand how I'm using the term shoulder there. So visually, I really enjoy that one inch gap between the top box and the bottom upside down U. Um, I've never made one like that. And I just want to say why. I can't imagine trying to vacuum all the wood stove dust out of it. So does that ever come up? Is that a thing or is that just me? I'm pretty sure that's just you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess if I was really... I've never even looked in there to see if there is dust. You know, I guess if I was, if it was really dirty, I'd get my compressor and blow it out. So Matt, I think this is a brilliant design. My only problem with it is I never have kindling that looks like that. You got to get it from L.L. Bean. <laughs> That's where yeah. I get that stuff. You can buy like a 30 pound box of it. I don't buy um, my kindling. I know, I know. Nowadays, I have so much wood scrap, I could go the whole winter just burning wood scrap. But um, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. Growing up in the Florida, we, you know, if you cut a pine tree down, you could take out the tap root. There's the kindling you need for years. Um, so I guess if you use dried hardwoods, you could chop it up and use that for kindling. But that's that's technically, I guess, what you'd call fat wood. You know, it's it's the old tap root of a pine tree. Matt Swilber, um, one more question on, on the top. Um, so you mentioned that you could put things on the top uh, of the box, of course, um, but the, the way that you constructed the top where you know you had th through, um, the through tenons and then you have about maybe an inch or so of the sides poking up above the top, was that, um, is that functional? Like there was there something that you imagined that you needed the little walls for, or was it more ref um, a reflection of the base? Um, it was in part an aesthetic choice, mm -hmm. uh, but it was also that, um, you know, at least me when I'm starting a fire, <coughs> I might have just, you know, brought firewood in. So I've got my gloves. I put my gloves on top. They don't fall off. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other little bits and things that could, you know, like after you if you've got like, I used to use one of those little uh, butane torchy things to, you know, light the fat wood. And so get the fat wood lit, put it down on top of there. It's like a little gallery that sometimes you see on tops of uh, period uh, bureaus and things like that. But it is also certainly an aesthetic choice. Um, it's, could you have made it with dovetails at the top? Yes. Um, but I, I, to be completely honest, I can't remember exactly 100% the exact reason why I did that. But I know it was a combination of aesthetics, but also wanting to have like a sort of a safe space to put things while you're working and making a fire or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I do, I do know a lot. A lot of times, you know, I would, I would always have a hatchet at my wood stove and I would be splitting up uh, pieces of firewood to make stuff a little bit bigger than the kindling. You know, in theory, you, you start small and slowly add bigger pieces. And so those little smaller chopped hatcheted up pieces, I would put on top of there too. All right, so um, to make, you know, uh, like bold graphic statements, this is a drawing of the piece I'm about to show you, and you might think that this is an overly simplified version of, uh, of what I'm about to show you, a very stylized piece, but in fact, it's really not. 
Um, what I did with this piece in particular was I took the structural elements of it and used them to create, you know, an array or a ge I often call them a, a geometry just because it's shapes. But, you know, there's a, an arrangement of shapes on the front of this piece. And it's, you know, it's, you know, the door, the drawers, the base, the negative space, all of that being used to create something aesthetic just from the shape of those parts. Um, and I try to do this with, you know, everything that I make to really take advantage of those components of the piece and have them uh, say something, you know? And, um, you know, I don't know if I succeed or not, but that's what I'm trying to do. So this, this is even further in this piece, it's even more sort of brought out by, you know, the door, instead of making it cherry, it's basswood uh, with green fabric in it. Uh, and that's a Coco Bolo uh, sort of a molding. It's really the outer frame of the Kumiko. Um, and then that Coco Bolo divider in between the top two drawers, uh, again, emphasizes not just sort of the shape of the drawers, the size of the drawers, but also the overall structure of the piece. Uh, in an attempt to have the structure become part of the, uh, you know, the aesthetic uh, statement of the entire tea cabinet. Um, and I will point out on this piece, the divider between the door and those two drawers next to it is not in the center of the cabinet. So the spacer bar or this piece of wood in between the base and the, and the box itself is also off-centered. It's directly beneath that vertical divider, which you can imagine if it had been centered, that would have created some visual disruption, visual disharmony uh, that would have uh, made the pieces as a, as a whole have less success than whatever success it does have. Um, so, but again, even though, so this piece, which is another tea cabinet, has a very different feel than the first two tea, the tea box and the tea cabinet I showed you. Uh, it looks quite different. You know, the inspiration for it came from that kindling box, but it still is in fact uh, functional. So it has, a, you know, the two drawers up top are for, tea packets, there's a spot for tea, loose tea. Um, you can see there how I'm using the dovetails also as something that's, uh, you know, as part of the aesthetic statement. And what you actually don't see here is that behind that door is room for a tea set. So enough for a little teapot and cups. And if I quickly, if I jump really quickly back to this piece, here I've used the structure of it to create a spot for a teapot, but in a very different way than I've done here. So again, if you think about the different functions or the, the different uses that something is gonna have, and you think about those, if you rethink them and think about them individually, you can start to break apart how a piece of furniture is going to go together. And then once you do that, you can start to take advantage of that to make aesthetic statements, you know, to make design choices. Right. I like the, I have way you have the, the green top in that bottom drawer. There's like a little uh, box in there or a cubby. Yeah, yeah. You know, that echoes the, it's, that seems like it would be a nice little surprise to see that when you open the drawer. Right. One of the things I do like to do in all, and more or less everything that I make is have, like when you open it, there is some type, type of pop of color or a, yeah, I usually use fabric inside so that there's 
a really nice uh, splash of color. But sometimes I will, like behind this door is actually it's all milk painted white. And so when you open it, not only is it bright, but also the teapot itself gets silhouetted against that white background. And so when you open it, there's, there's like this new aesthetic surprise. And it's like, oh, here's, you know, you're using the teapot even to make, you know, a design choice. You know, that becomes part of the piece overall. And when I made this piece, that teapot, I, I already owned it. And I was like, this is the teapot that's going to go there. So I want, so it fits as a whole with that cabinet, you know? Um, and that's an idea I sort of, I guess I got that from this, I guess the Green Brothers who, you know, when, and also uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, when they designed homes, they would also design all the furniture. And they would have thought it very strange if someone sold the house and took the furniture. Because for them, the furniture was part of the home. And so when I'm designing things uh, that are going to be used to hold stuff, I want to have the thing it's going to hold in my possession and to see it so that I can think about how that tea cup or the teapot is going to look inside the cubby or sitting on top of the piece. And so it, it becomes it becomes part of the story. So the big right. just, uh, just real quick, describe the implementation of that green background. I'm not sure what it is that we're looking at. It's fabric. Oh, it's fabric. fabric that is glued to usually, typically I use eighth inch plywood. So it's just glued down to the plywood and then it fits this door might have had a rabbit on the back. And then, you know, I covered it up. Uh, but nowadays when I do this, like on a door, it'll be a traditional frame and panel door construction. And so that plywood with fabric on it, or it might be shiagami paper or handmade paper or something like that, it goes inside the groove that the panel would go in. All right. Um, all right, so we saw that stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah. But what about the top of that little box now? Because that's the same color. That's not fabric, is it? Well, it's probably not exactly the same color. That's actually milk paint. Yeah. Um, and it looks like there's a color of green that I mix by, at, you know, by mixing up different other milk paint colors to get that green. Um, and that looks like what it, and I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So it's very close to the green of the fabric, but it's not identical. And one of the things that I would say about that is, is that unless you can get two different, like a fabric and a paint exactly the same, don't try to. You, if you can't get them exactly the same, then, the, then whatever the one you have control over, let's say it's the paint, that needs to be a distinctively different color, even though it, they're both green. In reality, the, the box inside the drawer is darker than the fabric. And that way it looks intentional. Whereas if you try to get it really close and they're not close, it just looks like poorly matched. So you want all your des design decisions to be intentional. All right, uh, so here's another uh, thing that I would say is, we, and I, so I, in high school, I took two years of mechanical drafting and a year of architectural drafting. I heard so many times that form follows function, form follows function, form follows function. In a way that's, and that's absolutely true, that if you're gonna make a tea cabinet, or a tea box, it's got to actually do what it's meant to do. Uh, but that doesn't mean that function has to determine the form. So the three that I've shown you so far illustrate that. They're all tea boxes slash cabinets, but they all look very different. 
Um, and uh, so I never know exactly, what, but you know, they, you know, there's more than one way to deal with a cat, right? There's more than one way to execute, you know, to make something that serves a utility uh, and yet has a very different form. And so we'll eventually have a, a different meaning and a different story in the lives of the people that own it. Uh, this is another tea box that I made. I actually just made this one in the last few months for an article that I wrote for um, Wood Magazine. So you'll get both the Kumiko in the box and, and the, it's two articles, but anyways. Um, but even here, like I'll say that uh, I think about the tea packets that are going, you know, go in the box. And I know that not everyone's going to have these same tea packets, which personally I buy because I like the colors and then they're good for photography. But um, uh, I do think about things like that, like how high is the tea pack going to stick up? What colors do they come in? You know, how are they going to be seen when you take the lid off? Uh, things like that. Um, all right, uh, let's go. So here's a tea cabinet that I made for uh, someone in Utah. And those four drawers hold, each one of them is big enough to hold tea packets. And uh, I thought about, you know, different ways to uh, have drawers but also have the tea cabinet do something more than just hold tea packets. So I put, I left two of the, what could have been two more drawers, left those out so that there could be a teacup on display in there. Um, and when you add that into the box, it gives the box or the tea cabinet a much different feel than if it were just six drawers. You know, visually it would be, well, I don't, I mean, it would be boring if it was just six drawers. Uh, the, the piece of pottery there makes it sort of like a mixed media art piece or something, you know? And it also gets at the function of, excuse me, gets at the function of the, or the, the, the utility of the piece because it's holding a teacup. And uh, the, the overall construction and design of the piece, you can see echoes back to the uh, kindling box, which that form in and of itself, I got the idea for from shaker pieces that I had seen, and you've probably seen them too, where the side of the case comes down past the bottom, and then the shakers always did like a half circle cutout to create feet at the bottom. And so, that was, uh, there's another piece that I made, and I don't know if there's time, maybe I can pull it up and show it to you, where I first started to play around with that shaker, uh, that shaker design form. And, and eventually it led to this, where you separate, I separate out the feet from the side of the case, but the grain still runs up and over the case. So the, the grain is still sort of tying it together, even though it's been separated. Um, okay, so that's uh, just, you know, here again, function not determining the form. Here's another one, uh, which now everyone's going to say, well, God, they all look the same because they all have that same basic design. But here, I knew I was going to make it out of walnut and apple drawer fronts, and I wanted to find some green teacups. And I happen to know, well, I know a lot of ceramicists, but this one in particular, I know pretty well. And she happened to have these and they're just, they even are somewhat evocative of Japanese bowl and cup forms a little bit. And so they fit really well with a tea cabinet. And I like the idea of having one for each drawer. Uh, and so there's the four drawers to hold the, the the, the, the tea packets, you know, there could have been one drawer, there could have been two drawers, but I went with four because it created symmetry between the display of the teacups and the drawers 
Um, and in fact, this cabinet is actually deep enough that there's room that eventually I want to make a box that goes in behind them. But uh, I don't know if I'll ever get around to that. But here you can also see how I've used the, the back is, is plywood. And on the front, the side that we see is shop sawn basswood veneers. On the back side of it is walnut. But the basswood there silhouettes the cups and allows them to stand out a little bit more and to become part of uh, the, 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 tea, the tea cabinet itself. So, you know, again, because when I think about tea cabinets, I think about their, their utility, their function for me is not just to hold tea packets, but there's also something about the ritual of drinking tea, which, uh, you know, I, which I know in Japan, there's the tea ceremony. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert about that and all the ritual involved. But there was the ritual of afternoon tea at fine woodworking. But there were, then there was also my British grandmother, who she was born in England. My grandfather married her at the end of the Second World War and brought her back to the States. And so there was a ritual around drinking tea and coffee with her that I guess has stuck with me throughout my life. And so now when I think about these cabinets I make, I think about the entire experience of making tea, uh, drinking tea. Normally for me, it's always been something that's done communally. So I think about a group of people sitting around and drinking tea and how does this piece that I'm making fit into that cultural discussion that's taking place or that social discussion that's taking place. You know, um, how, did, how can I weave this into the fabric of someone's life? Because um, that's really, I mean, successful furniture is the furniture that people keep around. It's not, it, in, in, in some ways it almost has nothing to do with how pretty it is. But of course, being pretty helps. But there's just something else about it, about its utility, about its beauty combining um, and the way that it works into the routine of their daily lives that gives it meaning for them that is beyond just its function. Uh, so I, I think about all of that stuff when I'm making tea cabinets in particular, and I try to sort of, you know, think about how this fits into that overarching discourse that's taking place in someone's life. Um, so here's another, this is a slightly different thing, but um, <clears throat> this is a sake set that belonged to that same grandmother. Uh, it was actually given to her, it was bought in Miami of all places by one of my aunts or aunts and uh, given to my grandparents as a gift. And I, I could remember it in their house from as long as I lived, for as long as I lived. And after they both passed, I was able to keep this as a memento of them. And this is actually in my dining room. Um, again, taking the function, you know, a box to store, this, you know, sake set, which is sentiment, has great sentimental value to me, taking that utility, that function, and exploding it to create uh, a design or aesthetic statement with it. And also by literally, you know, breaking it apart to give a place of emphasis or a place of privilege to each piece in the set. Um, so it's, and again, this, this is an example of using the structure or the components of a piece to say something, you know, this could have very easily just been a single case with different shelves on it and they all sat in it, but that would have somehow been like cluttered and the pieces wouldn't have, the sake set would not have been able to say anything you know you wouldn't have seen them as distinctly if they were all huddled in close to one another 
Um, I did have a question. So, sure. How did you mount the these guys on the wall? So the back that you see is eighth inch plywood, and that's glued in to each individual box. And then behind those is another, I think it was quarter inch plywood that I used. Yeah, it was quarter inch. And I made French cleats. So each one of those is hanging on a French cleat, a tiny little French cleat. And you can't see it from this angle, but to the wrap, so there's a rabbit on the back of each one of those. There's a piece of eighth inch plywood glued into it. It's a quarter inch deep rabbit. So that eighth inch plywood takes up half the rabbit. When I glue in one part of the cleat, the part that gets glued in, that's a quarter inch thick, it sticks out an eighth of an inch. So all of these boxes are floating off the wall. And uh, so when you see it from the side, they look like they're not attached to the wall, uh, which is something I like to do. Um, I didn't, so, well, it's not an hour. So this, I think, actually is the last slide. Um, if you guys would like, I can show you, I think I can sh quickly show you sort of how I treat the interior of some things, if you want to see that, or if there are questions. Sure, please continue. Okay. <clears throat> uh, to, to, you guys are going to get to see all my photos here. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. This is all business stuff. All right. Um, you might see my kids. Oh, I hate the way this goes now. Oh, all right. Where's that cabinet? It's funny how when you quickly scroll through all the stuff you've made, how it seems to lose any significance. All right. So here's a cabinet I made a little, uh, it's made from red, quarter sawn red oak, and the liner is uh, basswood. So the two pieces of pottery in there get nicely silhouetted. Uh, and also when you open it up and the light reflects around inside off that light, you know, the light colored surface, it illuminates what's inside. And I really, I like that effect. Um, I can show you some other things that I do. How do you trips to wood? Australia. How do you keep the brasswood, uh, basswood from uh, yellowing? Well, it's, it's you know, or is it just 99% just... of the time it's, um, well, I don't put a finish on it for one. Okay. So it's not going to get yellowed from that. And then it's enclosed, you know, and out of UV light most of the time. Hmm. So the, the light's not going to uh, darken it either. Um, oh, here, well, here's an example of using a painted, it's a somewhat painted interior to uh, allow what's on display to really stand out. Yes, even my tool cabinets get absurdly elaborate. Uh, so here's, uh, well, here, this is actually where I'm sitting right now uh, at my desk beneath uh that wall cabinet another example of using here a lightly a light blue painted background as a way to silhouette what is uh in storage in front of it um and there are some more recent things uh so here is a uh, credenza that i'm making for myself uh, where I was talking earlier about wanting to have a pop of color when you open it up. So here you have this cherry exterior with figured cherry drawer fronts and uh, doors. And when you open it up, you get this really beautiful green that's further sort of isolated or emphasized by the basswood uh, dividers around it. Um, so again, another use of that. There's one more recent, well, okay, well, let me 
go all the way to today. So this is a cabinet I am about to ship out. It's made from Western Hemlock. And what, here's one thing about Western Hemlock. Even when it's quarter sawn, it shrinks like crazy. You can see the gaps on these drawers here, which were all made uh, when it was more humid. Uh, and it just, they shrunk like crazy. It's hard to believe. Um, but here's using a blue interior, uh, which by accident is very close in color to my living room walls. But um, using the blue interior to create sort of, you know, a visual pop of color, a visual surprise, but also as a means to silhouette what is behind, you know, in front of it. Um, and I can quickly, I think, show you the interior of some boxes. So I normally, uh, well, not normally, I always the in the what I do is glue fabric to the top of the bottom, and then glue the bottom into a rabbit. So you can see the sides come down and very cleanly meet the fabric. So if you use like a cushion, like a, a foam cushion, and and wrap fabric over it, it gets it gets kind of messy and tucked and everything. And so I glue it to the plywood, and then that plywood gets glued into the rabbit, and uh, it looks it's very it's a very clean finish to it. So uh, you know I always put some type of fabric in the bottom of my boxes, and usually you know the the color and the and the pattern in some way harmonize with the exterior of the box. Um, so that's these three boxes in the same arrangement. So the slate blue one with the tiger maple lid is the one that has the blue fabric inside it. And the yellow one with the walnut lid has the green fabric, et cetera. So um, I'm a huge fan of the use of color in woodworking, which uh, sometimes is not received so well. So, <laughs> but it doesn't, that's all right. Uh, well, are there any questions or? Yeah, that can... Kumiko in the background there looks pretty time intensive. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, that, that is, that one is featured in the book that I wrote. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's not as intensive as you think uh, because the little, not, so the big patterns are called Asanoha but the small patterns in between them, those little pieces and each square is an individual set of six pieces that are, that are interlapped together. And what I did was completely assemble those little, they made like six legged hashtags. And I made a sled for my table saw that allowed me to just run them through the blade and that would cut a 45 down one side rotate it, cut it. So I was able to like individually assemble them and then very quickly cut the 45 on all four sides and have it be perfectly, you know, in a sense centered and then just pop them into the openings. Which I, I don't think, I, I have video of that, but I don't think it's on this iPad. Now, Matt, what type, just out of curiosity, what type of glue do you use when you uh, when you use um, material and you're gluing it to plywood, what kind of glue would you use for that? I use spray adhesive, so 3M77 works really well. Uh, there's also something that you can get at fabric stores, which the name of it I can't remember, but it's like a gray bottle with like a purple cap over it. Uh, it's something tacky, something or another. Uh, but I, I can't remember what it's called. But yeah, spray adhesive. Once it, I mean, that the spray adhesive does hold it down. Now, can you pull it up afterwards? Sure. But once it gets into the box and the rabbit, once it's the, the bottom is glued into the rabbit, then the edges of the fabric are held in place. So I've not had any trouble with fabric coming up on its own. Could you? put your fingers down there and pinch it and pull it up probably. But, you know, there's lots of ways you can intentionally destroy woodwork. So 
I don't think that's necessarily a, uh, a demerit, so to speak. When I look at your pieces, you have some really delicate handles. And I guess I've always thought of handles as something that you screw in from the back. Mm -hmm. But tell me a little bit about how you attach them and have there been any failures? So one thing that you, I guess we have to, to realize is that like these boxes are four by five. So four inches by five inches. They're very small. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I've shown you has been very delicate stuff. So uh, the, the, the pulls, these pulls are two inches long and the height of the arc is five sixteenths and they're three eighths of an inch thick. Um, and those get glued down with CA glue. Now I've not had one fail in the sense of the glue just gave way. I use, so if you're gonna use CA glue and you want long-term success with it, one, do not use an accelerant because the accelerant makes the glue brittle. And that's why like, especially you hear Turner's talking about CA glue giving way or you know failing if you use an accelerant it makes it brittle and it's way more likely to fail um but also i use a ca glue called rapid fuse which used to be called nexabond and when that when rap when dat brought rapid fuse to the magazine to try to like to show it to us it was me and my buddy Patrick McComb from Fine Home Building. We were in the shop with them. They took Rapid Fuse and eight quarter cherry. They glued two pieces of eight quarter cherry together, ingrained to ingrain. And then we let it dry. You know, they, we clamped it and let it sit for whatever long, like 20 minutes or whatever. And then we clamped it cantilevered out over the edge of a workbench and stood on the short piece that was glued to the longer piece and it would not break. So I'm completely confident in DAP's rapid fuse. And so I've never had one fail unless someone was like, uh, you know, hitting it or something, you know, in other words, trying to make it fail which is a whole different question. Uh, but I, mm -hmm. some pools, so like, ooh, here's the cabinet I just showed you. So that pool, and it's the same for all these drawer fronts. The pool is dovetailed into here, it's the style with the drawers, it's the top edge of the drawer front. So there is something mechanical holding it in place. And those I would also glue in with uh, just yellow PVA glue. The reason I use CA glue on little pulls for boxes is because um, clamping them and having them stay in place is just too difficult. You know, uh, it's just, it's, it's, they tend to slide around or it's, you can't really get a good clamping solution to get a clamp over them all kinds of things like that, just problems crop up. And with, in particular with DAP Rapid Fuse, a couple of drops on there and you press it down with your hand for 15 seconds and it's set, you know? And then after it's fully cured, it's, it's really strong. So, um, so exactly what I would do depends on really the, how delicate the thing is that I'm working with. You know, obviously, if possible, I want some type of mechanical fastener there. So in the past, even on something this small, I would drill little holes in the bottom of the pull, glue brads in there, you know, cut the, the head off the brad, glue it in the holes, and then glue holes in the lid and put those down in the lid and glue those in as well. Um, I think that's overkill now, but it is something I've done in the past. Cool, thank you very much. Sure. <clears throat>
Matt, are most of your uh, uh, colors uh, sprayed on or brushed no, on? No, I brush paint, I'll always brush paint. Um, I use, so I make, you know, I use old fashioned milk paint company, milk paints. And um, I use a type of brush that has the bristles are made from a, a material called Taclon. And I have found that Taclon, the paint really comes off Taclon very smoothly. It flows really nicely off Taclon. But also there's, you know, I now I do usually do two coats and then sand it with 320, do another coat, sand it with 320. And I keep doing that until I get the opacity that I want. Um, and then I'll either sand with 400 or I'll buff it with steel wool, like ultra fine steel wool, not for aught, but like Liberon ultra fine steel wool, something like that, and then wax over it. And so uh, I know it, these pictures, it's kind of hard to tell, but milk paint usually has a, a kind of a mottled color. It's, you can sort of see it in the green one and also the yellow one. How the, you know, like uh, latex paint, when you, when it's dry, it's just, it's a very uniform color, but milk paint always has variation in, in the, in the depth of it or how dark or light it is. So it changes in hue. So, and, uh, it almost seems to have texture. Matt, uh, can yes. I ask a question there? Um, I noticed these boxes here, they set on a very thin kind of pedestal. Is that actually part of the bottom placed into a rabbit or is it added separately to the bottom? It is part of the bottom. So the way all my box bottoms get made now is a plywood core. On the bottom side is shop on denier and the top side is fabric. And the rabbit that it goes into is always a little bit less deep than the thickness of the bottom so that the box is lifted up a little bit um, and uh, it feels a little bit lighter uh, sitting. Now this, these particular boxes, the, the bottom, the boxes themselves are basswood and you see how around the top edge of the box, you can still see the basswood. So the, the veneer that I use is basswood and I don't do anything with it so that the, the lightness of the basswood sort of mirrors the top edge of the box that you can see as well. Okay. So who has more teapots, you or Pekovich? <laughs> Probably Pekovich. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, he, well, he drinks tea and so, uh, but yeah, he probably has more. I'm pretty sure the last time I like had an idea about it, he was definitely him. And I probably only have like three or four in my house. Since I joined this group, I've realized that the people here can make a box precisely to the content. Someone here, I think it was Merle, not sure, made a bathroom cabinet. And it started by measuring the hairspray containers. And it's just very different from that product-based life that most people live. I'm also trying to make a block that can hold my knives. And I also kind of want to get this Chinese vegetable knife. And I just wonder how this how you relate with the idea that you're making something around its contents and the contents might change. I'm sure Studley's toolbox is a great example of something that is so beautiful and holds everything exactly. But what do you think on those planes? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to make something for a set, a predetermined pieces of, you know, you know, made to hold something that's predetermined, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. Um, but also have it be expandable. Um, 
the, the obvious choice here to talk about would be a tool cabinet. Um, and you can see the lower part of my tool cabinet was definitely, when I made that, I laid all the planes out and was like, okay, work backwards from that. How big does it need to be? Um, but the, I want, but I did want to sort of avoid the uh, trap of not being able to grow, have the tool cabinet grow as my tool collection grew. So I made it in a sense modular. The three, the, the three rows of drawers above that is a separate box that just sits on top. And inside those drawers, let's see if I can find, well, that's the, that's the bottom drawer right there. So the bottom drawer has this little tray that holds my chisels, my bench chisels. And it also holds my absurd uh, tape collection, um, <laughs> which you don't really need six. But there, there's two metric, right? One of them's flat back, one of them's not. Two flat backs and two standard tapes. I mean, that's not excessive. Uh, so there's that, that drawer. And da, 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 there it is again. I have the other drawer somewhere. Uh, well, there we go. So there's the middle drawer. And it holds uh, my chisels that aren't bench chisels. Well, that don't fit with those bench chisels. Some of them, I guess one of them is a bench chisel. But and it was also designed to hold my starret and a little block that I use when I'm transferring dovetails. Uh, so but they're still in a sense modular because all that could be taken out and rearranged. So that's one way you could go about it is to have the interior fitted, but fitted with things that can be taken out. So don't make that part permanent. Um, so I guess that's how I would go about it. But then also make it modular. And you also need to realize that there are like some things that, even though these are all, you can see all these tools, right? Not all tools need to be in your tool cabinet. So above my tool cabinet, where you see my six, my bits, bedrock 608 and the plow plane and the two little router planes. You know, those things I don't really use very often. And I, so I don't, the tool cabinet actually all fits in my truck and I can take it with me to, when I teach if I want. There's other things I don't really need very often. So I just made a nice display to put them on. And the little drawer is for all the blades for my router planes. But at the other end of my bench, those are things that uh, are very good to have within arm's reach. And, and because you, I use them a lot, and I also want to have a place to put them back that's just as easy to get them down from. And so those are all hanging on the wall. So the other way to think about it is, is that not everything needs to fit into the case that you make, whatever that's for. So um, a lot of times when I am designing stuff, whether it's, uh, you know, if it were going to be a credenza or I was actually uh, I'm designing uh, a um, bedside table. And I don't, I wish I had those drawings on here. I could show you all the different ways I came up with of you know, having it be a bedside table, but also have it not be something that you're utterly completely tied to, you know, so that in some way the storage was modular. You know, maybe that's a little too much of the Ikea influence on my life, but I often think about that, like, how could I make this expandable down the line? You know, what could I, so what, how could I, like, what can I bake into the design? the design up front so that if I have to add to it later, it won't look weird. So with like my tool cabinet, I made it initially, you can see like, okay, this, the box with all the planes in it, 
you see how it's sitting up on two little spacers, just like the box with all the drawers in it. So, you know, in theory, I could make another box and put it on top of that one, or I could make, it's almost like a, you know, like it's like the, like a Tansu approach to design. Because each one of these things is designed to hold the specific things that it holds, but the overall thing as a whole is not limited because you can, you can add to it. And it is that, that Tansu approach to design and storage. So I guess that's my answer. That's really cool, thank you. And that's my shop. It's also green. <laughs> I like green. Nice workbench, by the way. Thank you. I made that like 13 years ago. Almost, no, 12 years ago, I guess. 12 years ago. It's one of the first things I did at Fine Woodworking. There's a video series about it. <clears throat> I did not name it, but they named it Matt's Monster Workbench. Did you fix the vice yet? No. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, my the vice cover is a little too short, and so it's always like falling. Oh, and also the the handle. I need to fix the handle so it doesn't fall out. There's just so much else to do. Uh, well, any other questions or? Great presentation, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Matt one other question. Uh, I just saw something, I think on your website recently that intrigued me. I think it was a wall cabinet that used end grain, that used the, uh, the, for part of the front drawers, I think, some slices of end grain that I thought was really attractive. I wonder if you could, if you have a picture, that would be great. And if you could talk about how you incorporated the end grain. Yeah, there you are. Yeah. I think that's so neat. How did you incorporate that in there? So it's been years. Um, this happens to be Douglas fir. Uh, it's, I found this piece of old growth Douglas fir at one of my, at the lumber yard I go to the most in, it's so figured that you can see even the ingrain is figured. Do you see the ripples in it? Yeah. yeah. It's just absolutely, it's crazy. It's a spectacular piece of material. Um, so it's, you know, ingrain is difficult to work with. One, because it's fragile, especially in a softwood like Douglas fir, uh, but also because you know, like wood movement on a piece of flat, on a flat sawn board, wood moves the most tangentially to the grain. So if you have a flat sawn board, that means it's going to move a lot across its width. Hmm. Well, in grain kind of moves everywhere. And so the wood, the movement of in grain is really difficult to contend with. But like normal veneer, right? normal wood, the thinner the piece of wood is, the less and less and less it acts like wood. So that's why you can glue veneer down to something like MDF and not have wood movement problems. So the, the, when I make, this is the first piece I ever made with ingrained veneers in it. And although none of the veneers have ever fallen off, in the winter they do get cracks in them. Hmm. Uh, but I've since made pieces that did not have that issue. And the real key is that the veneer be very, very thin. So uh, probably around a 16th to 3 30 seconds. I usually cut them at 3 30 seconds. And then once they're glued down, I will sand them. And so mm. that brings them under 3 30 seconds of an inch. Uh, so that's, yeah, so it's just veneer glued to, in this case, it would have been quarter sawn cherry. Uh, I always glue it to something quarter sawn because like I just said, you know, wood moves the most tangentially to the grain. Well, tangential to the grain in a piece of quarter sawn stock is actually through the thickness of the stock. And if the thickness of that drawer front changes, 
it's really not going to put any stress on the veneer. So I use quarter sawn stock when I do that. Yeah, so this piece actually hangs in my bedroom. Uh, it's what I see when I wake up in the morning. It's across from the foot of my bed. I'm going to put in a plug for Matt here. He did an online course on how to make this cabinet, including the end grain veneers. It ran through six different lessons. Uh, it was 125 bucks for the whole course, and it was excellent. I highly recommend it. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you. <laughs> Those just are kind fun. Of, just, just kind just of curious, curious if, um, if you're putting veneer on that draw face, why use a hardwood for the backer anyways? Why not just use MDF or plywood or something? Well, one, it's dovetailed. Oh, so, I see. Uh, you know. That explains I, it. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I, you know, if it were MDF or something, you would then have to, in some way, treat the top and the bottom edge and also the ends of it. You know, it, it just becomes a little more complicated and making it solid wood allows you to do the good old fashioned dovetail joint there. Mm -hmm. You can see one of the cracks. And you actually, on the top shelf, on the end, the top drawer, the end closest to us, you can see a little crack. Mm -hmm. And on the bottom drawer at the far end, you can see that massive crack, which mm. opens up every single winter and then every single summer it closes. Mm. Uh, but those are those are probably closer to an eighth of an inch thick, and uh, they're they're more problematic because they're so thick. Yeah. So um, here's another example of ingrain veneer. That's cool. Uh, yeah, well, that was the original door for that cabinet that I showed earlier, but I learned something else with those veneers, and so I ended up not using the door. This is the new door for it, which is why it's a different color than the rest, because it hasn't aged yet, but it will eventually age and be that sort of brownish color. So, um, yeah. Any uh, uh, other questions or? Yeah, Matt, what finish are you putting on your casework? Everything, and it may, it may be your lighting doesn't seem to uh, show any kind of shine or anything like that. I know you're putting wax on your on your milk paint, but what are you putting on the cherries or your fur, or your other woods that you're using? Yeah, so this cabinet has shellac. Hmm. I pretty much use shellac on everything unless it's, you know, if I were to make like a, a dining room table, that would not have shellac on it. You know, like yeah. that lid has, these lids have shellac on them. Um, I use, generally I use ultra blonde shellac and make a really light cut, maybe three quarters of a pound cut. Oh, yeah, and, uh, you know, for things, you know, but again, that's because their, their use, if it was something that was to be more heavily used, I would do a heavier cut of shellac probably. <laughs> And, it, and I'd probably end up spraying it because uh, this stuff I wipe on with a cloth, but it dries so fast that you don't really run into problems. But if I were to do a heavier coat, I'd probably spray it. Yeah, are you rubbing it out so you don't have any shine? I do. So I usually do two coats, wet sand it with 800 grit, right. do a third coat and hit it with ultra fine steel wool to even out the sheen and then wax it. Mm -hmm. You're good. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I hate to do, but I have to go pick my daughter up at school. Uh, so um, if, I could probably take one or two more questions. Good. I think we're good, Matt. Yeah. Okay, well, let me uh, just, let me go back to uh, Zoom. Now, stop the share. All right, there we go. All right. Well, thanks for having me. It was, it was enjoyable. Oh, it was excellent. Nice work. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Yes. It was also Very surprising. Good. I wasn't expecting to see David or Wilbur here. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, 
Sorry? The, the one thing I just wanted to say back when you were talking about Frank Lloyd Wright is that there's a big difference between you and Frank Lloyd Wright, and that is you're actually good at designing furniture and other things. Like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he wasn't designing furniture for comfort. No. <laughs> I can't imagine. You know, like the traditional shaker ladder back chair, you know, Chris Bexford calls them 20 minute chairs. He said mm -hmm. that they, the shakers designed them so that they would not be comfortable for more than 20 minutes because they didn't want the brothers and sisters getting lazy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I wonder if maybe Frank Lloyd Wright really didn't like guests in his house. Yeah. I, I think he might have just been working out some issues. Yeah. <laughs> Ups, upstairs, he had lazy boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Well, it was very good. Yeah, yep. Thank you very much. Very good. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. All right. Yeah, I mean, okay. How do you wrap up a Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>